to everyone. Uh, this is our first Cree talk. Uh, just briefly for those of you that don't know uh, uh, who Cree is, Cree is a, a global construction collective delivering systemized timber hybrid buildings in local markets. And we are operating in Europe, uh, Asia, and uh, in the United States, and also very soon in Canada. Uh, as part of our 10 year anniversary of Cree buildings, this Cree talk is dedicated to the topic of green funding. And together with uh, selected industry experts, we will discuss how funds can contribute in meeting the sustainable development goals and how this can stimulate the construction sector. Now, if you think about it, between now and 2050, more than 20, uh, 92 billion square meters of new space uh, shall be built. And this is quite a challenge if you consider the shrinking resources on the one side and the prod productivity uh, in the construction sector on the other side. But more importantly, if all this needs to be built, what impact this shall have on the greenhouse gas emissions uh, on a global scale. Right? So today we want to take a closer look at what role and responsibility green funds play in contributing to achieving to the sustainable development goals, moving away from fossil towards sustainable investments. And we're going to look at how is the construction sector perceived in stepping up and what does it take to realize investments in green buildings? I uh, would like to welcome uh, all the guests that have registered today. And I also want to, of course, welcome our speakers today and participants here in the panel. And for this, I would like to uh, say hello to Ursula Hartenberger. Let me just tell you briefly a little bit about uh, Ursula Hartenberger. Ursula is a highly experienced sustainability professional and founder and director of Path to 2050 which is a Brussels-based consultancy providing tailored advisory services regarding the built environment, the policy issues such as energy efficiency and whole life of carbon, sustainable finance, building data management, circularity and creation of social value. For more over a decade, she has been driving force behind efforts aimed to fully integrating sustainability considerations into the real estate investment decision making. As a member of a series of high-level international sustainability and climate platforms and in initiatives uh, on the EU and UN level, <clears throat> Ursula has been instrumental in strategically positioning these initiatives and in increasing the visibility of the construction and real estate sector as the annual UN climate summits. Ursula, hello. Uh, you are still muted, Ursula. Maybe, uh, this. Thank you very much, Volker, for that kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here today, and I'm really looking forward to the discussions. It's, it's great to have you. Thank you for, for taking part in this. Um, now, I would like to uh, bring up our next uh, guest today, which is our own founder and CEO, Hubert Romberg. Um, I would like to introduce Hubert Romberg just briefly. He founded Cree Buildings in 2010. He's an entrepreneur, a construction engineer, and in the fourth generation CEO and owner of the Romberg Group, which is a family owned uh, construction conglomerate with over 3000 employees and over 800 million euros in turnover. Um, Creep Buildings has 27 core team members, is a highly committed to sustainability and resource efficiency and a global network of partners uh, consisting of over 100 individuals working around the globe. Hubert, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Thanks for the hint. <laughs> Thank you for, for uh, uh, setting this up. I'm very happy to, to have this conversation with, with you guys. We have a, a very important uh, uh, issue uh, to handle. We know what has to be done and probably today we can talk a little bit about what does that has to do with money. Great. I'm really excited that we what, that we have this discussion. Uh, thank you, Hubert. Um, I would like to uh, introduce our uh, third panelist, uh, Jacob Rowe. Uh, Jacob, if I may just introduce you a little bit. Uh, you have quite a track record. Uh, you're an entrepreneur, you're an operator turned 
in Investor, you have launched several technology products, including during your time, Rocket Internet, Europe's largest venture builder and investor. Uh, Jacob, you have been advising several startups as an investor and large internet companies. You've worked together with Edge Technologies, which is a leading developer in smart, sustainable real estate. Uh, you have also been a senior advisor to McKinsey, uh, an active angel investor in construction, and um, companies such as Spacemaker, which I believe was recently acquired by Autotask and Dispersed. Um, your recent venture, 2150, is a 200 million euro venture capital fund investing at the intersection of technology and sustainability in areas with strong positive impact on urban environments as they contribute to scale and consume the lion's share of energy and resource globally. So uh, this is really uh, a pleasure for us to have you here, Jacob. Thank you for being here. I, I don't hear you yet, Jacob. Maybe you are still muted, is that possible? Okay, while we cannot hear Jacob, and I, uh, I hope you can uh, maybe fix on uh, fix your uh, technical backup, uh, we will move forward in our in our agenda, and I would like to tell all the participants that we are recording this uh, Cree talk today about green funding, and we will make this available to you as you have registered for this event, and um, first. Before we go into the questions and debate here today, I would like to open up a little bit the floor to Hubert Romberg to express his uh, idea and his thoughts on today's topic. And I would like to hand over to Hubert Romberg now. Thank you very much, Volker. So for me personally, it's, it's very important just at the beginning to stress out. And this is always part, was always part of our motivation, the motivation to found, to start with Cree. And the strategy of the whole group is that we really need change on the planet. So we are, the signs are clear. We are approaching tipping points. Uh, if those tipping points combine or approached, that's not in our hands anymore. So that's something very, <laughs> to put it on the table, that's the problem we have on the planet. So everyone is needed. Uh, and then uh, we have one thing which gives me hope. We have a social tipping point too. That means people start thinking to change. And that is a very, very important thing. And normally things takes much take much longer until they change. But when they change, it's much faster than everyone expects. And that's something we see happening now, not just publicly, but in the financial world. And this is very, very important. And and that's why I, I have some hope because uh, money going green means the biggest industry in the world is construction and real estate. I mean, it's not just by by volume the biggest, it, it's money wise, it's 85 trillion, the business worldwide, but from resource consumption uh, point of view. So we use 40%, uh, produce 40% of, I uh, use all of 40% of all the resources, our whole emissions coming out of the built environment. This is just crazy what, what's happening now. And when we follow what Volker said, those growth paths, to 92 billion square meters in 250, not changing the concept we built today is just insane. It's not gonna work. I mean, that's obvious. So 8% of all the carbon emissions worldwide are coming out of the construction sector. So this growth cannot be done with the old system, with the old concept. So the question is on the table, what can change? What can be changed? And just imagine we have in Europe alone 3 million contractors in construction. It's 3 million companies. <laughs> and, and it's just, and, 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 and the, 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 the average company has 25 employees. Depending on the country, it's between 12 and 30, and, but it's somehow there. So there is not the innovation and the change coming from. It has to come from different, from many sides. So, and, um, to sum up uh, my 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 view on this 
bright future for everyone who realizes that and 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 invests in that space or finds the future business in that space this is great but for everyone who's not realizing that probably will be out of business in 10 15 years so this is really a moment where technological divide probably we will see in the whole construction and real estate industry because up to now for a developer it was quite easy to to make the money okay because you 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 didn't have to care about what exactly you built you just you sold you sold an asset where you you had a, a multiple on the rent and fine you know but now investors start asking governments start asking we want to know what is part of this building what is in the building how do you build it and that's a massive disruption for the whole industry and that combined with digitization which gives us much more transparency in the process like uh, a digital twin seeing all the processes making them transparent access to more information give companies and people the possibility to share their know-how that's something really happening now and to sum that up from the money side they but they they need to see something which is like a label or they know okay that works that is sustainable that is green so it has to be somehow in a certain scientific proven way too so on one hand we have this chaotic movement in the whole industry on the other side you need some regulative safety about what the product is all about how we can meet those sustainable development goals and i say the money talks so we 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 should walk the talk the demand for green real estate assets will grow and i doubt if we can handle the supply but that's a good uh discussion i think for today excellent thank you hubert for um for this entry words and setting a little bit the the stage of today's uh, discussion um just a quick check on jacob jacob is your microphone working i i think he's still experiencing a little bit uh, technical challenges jacob can you say a few words I'm speaking, but I don't think you can hear me. Oh, yes, I can hear you. Ah, perfect. Great. Right. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Very well done. Now, um, a little question to all of you. Uh, I, I'm going to start with Ursula first. Ursula, um, in your opinion or by your definition, what, what do you understand when somebody says green? What does green mean, really? Well, can I expand that a little bit and say what, sus what sustainability means a little bit? Because I think uh, it's it's a bit two dimensional, one dimensional if we just talk green. I mean, for more, you know, because people don't really know what they what they have to understand when you say green. So some people, the social issue is automatically included in green, and for others, it's so. Let's just be very old fashioned and traditional and say sustainability. Um, for me. Um, it, it's not rocket science. I think it's it's uh, you don't use uh, you don't use more resources than you need, and you use them in such a way that they can regenerate themselves. So, in a construction and real estate context, this translates for me personally into designing quality, high quality, um, and building, constructing high quality and healthy buildings that are flexible, adaptable, uh, have a long lifespan. Um, easy to dismantle when they come to their end of use uh, with components that can easily be repurposed um, and that also serve the community that are aesthetically pleasing and fit into a local context. Yeah, so uh, this is obviously quite, quite, quite ambitious, but it actually should not be too difficult because when we look at, when we look, for instance, at urban contexts, it's, it's now those buildings that have been around for more than 100 years that command the highest prices and are the most, uh, uh, are the most popular uh, in many ways. So we should really, so it's nothing new, yeah? So in some ways we, you know, we should, uh, we should just adhere to some very, very basic principles. Um, and uh, yeah, that would be my take on sustainability and also sustainability in this sector. Fantastic. Thank you, Ursula. 
Uh, Jacob, do you have a do you have a uh, expression on on green? What does green mean mean to you when you look at real estate? Yes, I I am. Um, I really echo the the thought that that you know sustainability is just common sense if you really think about it. Yeah. You no, know, if you really think about the inefficiencies we see in the world. They're just often not very sensible. And if you would think of a sensible solution, you would you would achieve sustainability, which means some kind of balance. Um, I think because the world has become a little bit uh, uh, distorted in, in terms of balance, we um, we try to kind of make you know put a very simple message uh, to the world and to ourselves, which is um, sustainability is is I mean is the biggest issue we are facing because of the environmental crisis that the planet um, <clears throat> has gotten into and it's something we really need to solve and, and that's the main reason we started 2150 our investment firm um, and as a as a VC we are really looking for technologies and companies that have the potential to reduce gigatons gigacorns just to kind of you know <laughs> you know, put a word on it and give it, a, give, it a, give it a shape. But if you think about it, we just need 50 companies who can reduce each one gigaton per year to get to zero globally. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is obviously difficult. Um, but we are, we are convinced that this is possible and the technology is what we try to do uh, to accelerate that. And we're also convinced that given the size and the, and the, and the you know, the, the importance of the construction sector, the build sector in this equation, we will find uh, a few of these, uh, these gigacorns in the construction sector. We're going to transform it in, in really profound ways. That's, uh, that's very good. Thank you, Jacob. Um, Hubert, do you have a, a definition of green? In, in you, you are a builder, you are a developer, you're the founder of Cree. Um, what is your definition of green? when it applies to the construction real estate sector? Well, actually, I, I, I have strongly support the point of Ursula, you know, because it's a wider thing, you know. Uh, uh, we are a developer too, not just in construction. So it's very important to see how life, uh, uh, like living, like open spaces, like uh, how people, not, not, it's not just about the building, you know, a lot of developers and constructors, they see, okay, that's the building. But architecture is the space between the building, for instance, and it's so. This is very important that we focus on that too, and 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 that we realize that's that's one of the biggest quality. And another thing is a good architecture. You know, great architecture is the most sustainable thing because that's something people will never tear down. So it will be there forever. Okay, they take care about it. So this is keeping the resources together. And but at the same time, time thinking about flexible usage so we can probably we don't know what people in 40 years want to do with it so that they, they should at least be it's some flexibility to change it you know to change the usage and then we come to the building okay then we have all those bi biodiversity and all these issues but talking about construction then we come to the building and then we think about green means bringing down resource consumption because our problem is that we are not able to decouple now i'm talking, reading, writing since 20 years with partners from scientific communities, from the sustainability, religion, community, whatever, where I'm part of. It's not possible. You know, we try to sell the people, hey, we can have growth and we decouple it from resource consumption. And everything is fine. You know, that's not that easy. So even circularity to bring that up double means from 8.6 to probably 17 percent would bring down global warming potential by 30%. I mean, this is incredible. So there are different ways to tackle that issue, sustainability in the construction industry. But one main source is from the beginning in the design phase, use as less resources as possible. It's not about wood just, it's about using less of everything, but the best material for load bearing structures and, and, and future building is wood, you know? But it's always a part of, uh, 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 it's very important how you use it and how different materials are used and how you can get it back. So there must be a whole material uh, 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 transparency through the whole process 
And I would not, I told politicians when they said, hey, what can we do now? Because we have to change it. Okay, you, you make a new law and say, if someone approves, gives you the design for approval for a project, you get the, the drawings, you want an Excel sheet with the, a list of material, what's in it. And third, a small manual, how you disassemble it to get it back and reuse. Okay, that's part, you have to bring that together with the drawings, because then what would happen, the architect and the developer would think during the design process would already have to think about two and three, and that would change everything at the beginning. And this is very, very uh, uh, one, one step. The second step is like being more sustainable means sharing. You know, sustainability means we what we own is our ideas, is our knowledge. If I have a good idea, I give it Jacob. Jacob can use it. No, lose. I'm not losing anything. You know, and our market at the moment, our our economy is working a little bit differently. So sustainability doesn't mean just material or nature. It means a lot of our mind, our approach, how we how we see our shared. Uh, uh, capability of this planet, you know, so, but being, being more concrete, it's, it's at the end, all about material flow through our whole life and through our whole economy. And because construction is so big, it has the biggest possibility to change. Thank you, Hubert. Thank you. Um, Ursula and, and Jacob, short question towards you, um, just to make sure we have the definitions right here. What is ESG? What is uh, SDG? Is there a difference between the two, Ursula? Well, I'll start with SDG, okay? Because uh, SDG stands for Sustainable uh, Development Goals. Uh, this is essentially, uh, um, these are 17 goals um, set by the United Nations uh, in 2015. Uh, covering of you know a wide range of sustainability aspects, of ranging from you know ending poverty, education, uh, walk, clean water, uh, climate action, sustainable cities, uh, responsible consumption, but also um, social issues such as workers' rights um, and uh, you know and uh, um, things like uh, corruption. Um, and uh, so these really, I think for me, um, these goals, they represent the umbrella under which we're all doing what we're doing. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's uh, um, and I think under that, you see a lot of um, industry initiatives uh, developing that use these SDGs as a point of reference. Um, and I think um, I'll hand over to to uh, hand over for ESG and hand over to to uh, to Jacob if that's okay. Um, so that's very closely related. It's just for a different. It's it's just a term. ESG it means environmental, social, governance, and that means really um, it points to the same things, but for a different audience. Jo Jacob, do you want to take this? I think Jacob was frozen again. I have a little bit of a connection problem here. I don't know what, what where all these problems came from today, but um, I hope you can hear me. So, <clears throat> I, I, so SDG is also something we see very much as a framework within which we look for opportunities to, to have impact. And <clears throat> we don't believe we can influence all of them, but we, we sort of focus on certain of them. Um, ESG and SDG, I, I think actually you can ask many people and you will probably get slightly different definitions of what is what. Um, some say that ESG is more focused on sort of good behavior. That's, uh, uh, let's say, non-bad non behavior. So it's more like compliance thinking, where SDG is more sort of open innovation thinking, like what is really the full potential of what we need to do here? So that, that could be one way of framing it. But I, <clears throat> I, um, when, I, when I look to our, what we have agreed with our investors, and we have agreed very specific um, uh, you know, actions uh, in terms of how we you know, define good governance, how we make sure that we help our startups that we invest into to, to measure uh, their impact and to, uh, to, you know, be good corporate citizens. So we, <clears throat> I think a lot of, um, but when we read it, we use a lot of the SDG framework as a guiding principle. 
um, and, and, and tie it back to that. But I would also say that once you really start to look at the real stuff that you want to work on, right, you need to become very concrete. You need to really uh, go into to a different level of detail, which is not part of the SDG framework, which is something you need to break down for yourself and for your industry. I'm sure that Hubert and his team has done, you know, there was not a checklist from the UN or anywhere else that they could follow uh, to get to the point where they thought they had the, the impact necessary and possible. So this is really the challenge, and this is different for every, uh, every technology, every sector, every problem in business that you really have to become hands-on, very detailed. And this is, uh, this is, this is the challenge, right? And, and this will have to develop for each of the domains where there's a lot of uh, potential impact to have. Excellent. Um, while, while we're at it, Jacob, um, why, why would it be important for you to include ESG factors in investment decisions and the second part of the question would be why do you think more and more fund managers are going down this path well because they have to sorry for stepping it's in. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know even sorry even the biggest the biggest fund manager i don't name you know black xy you know black xy and stuff you know even that that ceo said now we have to we have to be good we have to change and everyone thought oh he woke up no he has a lot of investors in his fund pension funds of 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 teachers of of nurses whatever and they say hey we want something different okay and if the, if they don't see in the management people acting different now they are in danger. So that's to up to 90% their main motivation. But this is okay. I mean, it, it, we are forced to in our industry. I'm not judging, but that's why it's happening. Yeah. Well, I would also say that, so there's this compliance, de-risking uh, motivation on one side. And, you know, well, if the incentives are moving in the right direction, it's all good, right? So there's, no, there's no reason complaining. We can ask, is it moving fast enough? But I would also say that if you really start to model the true value of a legacy business that is not transforming into a, sustain, a true sustainability approach or a carbon neutral solution for its, for its customers, for its business goes to zero very fast. And I think more and more are realizing that this is probably going to happen in one way or the other at some point in some foreseeable future. Um, so you need to start thinking about it and you need to start managing for that. And assets are being repriced. If you look at the, the value of uh, the biggest oil companies in the last 10 years and compare that with you know, evolution in, in some of the, some of the uh, renewable energy technology companies, I mean, you see a very inverse pattern. Um, I think the other segment and the reason why uh, it's important is, of course, that we need, we need basically to finance and to invest into experimentation and R&D at the frontier of technology, um, because that's where a lot of, of change has to happen. I think you can, you know, we can probably imagine a good part of the solutions with the technologies we have today and the solutions we have today, we just need to adopt them. But there's still a pretty big chunk that we don't know yet. And this is where we need basically venture capital uh, and also government. We need basic research. We need all the ingredients of innovation in society to come together uh, to finance that experimentation and, and, and research and development at the frontier. And the frontier of technology now is really happening at the intersection of, uh, of sustainability uh, increasingly as we see it. So I think it's very clear also that some of the biggest opportunities for investors big problems. I got it, yeah. Uh, Jacob, you mentioned uh, frontier technology, and I remember you mentioning in an earlier conversation we had this week um, about uh, is there enough smart technology even in the market? Um, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, I, I think the, the really good news that we've seen, besides that more capital is, is, is moving, is looking for ways to invest into, into sustainability, um, even even so much that people speak about a bubble now, and um, and I think that's actually a good thing because <laughs> maybe as an investor it's a little bit scary. But if you if you look at at the last big technology bubble we had, 
you know, some investors, yes, they lost some money, but if you look at the outcome, right, this bubble in the 90s and the dot-com bubble basically financed the entire fundament of the innovation we've seen for the last 20 years in the internet, internet sector. So, so bubbles can actually have net positive spillover effect into the wider economy. So the, the, the end result might be good enough. So that's, well, there's, there's hoping. Uh, but we, we see more and more capital coming in. This is great. And we also see that the, the, the really super talent of the world, the most, uh, the, the most talented, bright, most motivated people who would uh, otherwise, you know, start an e-commerce. Sustainability in, the, in what they do. And we see that just increasingly. And I think there's a generational um, uh, shift there happening as well. So there's a new generation of entrepreneurs, there's a new generation of investors also in early stage uh, venture who are focusing uh, on this. And maybe there is a generational attitude shift. So the young, the young generations have probably been the most vocal in raising the attention to the level we have today, to be honest, right? So, so in all okay. fairness. Excellent. Yeah, great. Ursula, I, have, uh, I, I know you are also deep in the le legislative uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit on the EU taxonomy, right? What role does the EU taxonomy play when it comes to financing buildings such as green buildings or sustainable buildings? Um, I know there are some new standards on that. Would you, could you enlighten us a little bit on that topic? Yeah, sure, Volker. I mean, I'm a bit biased, of course, because, you know, I was heavily involved in developing the the criteria, uh, this technical screening criteria for the taxonomy for construction and real estate activities. So, you know, please excuse our bias if it if it uh, if it should if it should shine through. Um, but personally, I think that this is probably the most comprehensive uh, classification system for sustainable activities to date um, for okay, for green investment. And uh, it will help to bridge the massive existing financing gap that is still sadly an obstacle for reaching the EU Paris uh, Agreement goals. But it also gives a very, very clear signal to the market. Um, and for the finance world, it, you know, signal is has, the finance sector has a pivotal role to play in driving investment towards more sustainable, innovative technologies and business, such as the ones that uh, Jacob just mentioned, um, and to companies really that there's a business case for putting sustainability into practice and actually, you know, starting, starting to act. Um, from an investment side, I think it also helps investors to understand which country, which companies are actually really contributing to a low carbon transition. Yeah, and which building, which are building resilience to climate change and, you know, to avoid greenwashing. Um, for construction and real estate, this means that we finally have a common language around sustainable buildings, because I think this is something that the sector really has been grappling with for a number of years. Um, you know, what is a sustainable building? Because there hasn't really been a, you know, you know, you know, like a commonly agreed definition. And I'm not saying that the taxonomy answers all the questions, but it does provide a framework. And that is in a first and very important step in the efforts to chain sustain, you know, money to, towards sustainable buildings and sustainable construction. Because having us having a, this clearly set of defined criteria. Uh, will help to create more certainty and trust and provide a reference point for green investment. And this will not only help the finance community, but also provide a framework for developers and construction companies. I got it. This is great. And let me ask you then, um, when you look at the building certifications like LEED or BREAM, you know, what about, are they losing value or do they integrate in the taxonomy requirements? And how does this become a new international standard? I think it will become automatically an international standard because, you know, we don't we don't just invest, you know, the investment is not happening nationally or within the boundaries of the, the EU. So you have foreign investors who will who will invest within Europe and then they will have in order to actually be eligible for green finance, they will need to uh, demonstrate um, that their projects, their building, their assets are actually uh, taxonomy compliant. 
Um, so and then the European Commission is already engaging, uh, has an initiated an international sustainable finance platform whereby they are exploring, uh, you know, regulatory measures that are being developed in different parts of the world. And clearly, the taxonomy is one of the flagship things that the that the European Commission will will try and sell internationally. That's very clear. So, but in terms of the labels, um, I think. To stay relevant as a first step, I would say that they, you know, the certification systems will all need to map their crit uh, certification criteria against the taxonomy criteria, uh, once those have been finalized, obviously, to see how, how far um, their labels are actually covered, covering the taxonomy, but also covered by the taxonomy. I know that the DGMB has already done that um, on the basis of the recommendations of the tech, the technical expert group that uh, developed the technical screening criteria for construction and real estate last March. Um, they've also been closely involved in the whole process and they've also carried out um, recently a market study on the market readiness of um, of the uh, for, 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 for the taxonomy criteria with their members across the board so there were find that there were market participants from finance from uh project development construction companies uh but also insurers and valuers so um and uh one thing that became very clear from this study is that uh, those buildings that were certified uh, found it much easier to prove uh, taxonomy uh, eligibility um, and especially in relation to the do no significant harm criteria, i.e. Uh, the non-climate related uh, environmental objectives such as pollution, water, circularity um, and ecosystems. Um, and that clearly helps. So, you know, you have a better documentation base. Um, and uh, and I think that that at the moment is a clear advantage of those uh, certification systems because they're also capable of uh, covering the more social issues, uh, which are currently not covered by the, the, the taxonomy. So um, things like, uh, you know, community, community value, uh, but also things like health um, and, um, and, you know, the trans, you know, proximity to transport. And these are things that eventually will be developed uh, by by the taxonomy as well, you know there will be there will be taxonomies for for those other environmental objectives, but they don't exist at the moment. So in this transitional phase, yes, they do have they do have a role to play, uh, but I think they need to get engaged around this now. Um, and as I said, the DGNB has done that. Um, the others are still sitting a little bit on the fence. Mm -hmm. My feeling, you know, waiting, um, and that's probably. Not such a good idea, you know. But um, in terms of do they work? Yes, I think they do work because um, they also filled a gap um, when they first emerged. There was nothing else to provide some kind of benchmark or framework or um, a system whereby you could uh, you could actually instill trust in whoever was investing. Um, and they've greatly, greatly contributed to awareness raising uh, and to promoting sustainable construction and uh, designing and planning. Um, and that's not to say that a certified building is necessarily more sustainable than um, than a, a than a not certified mm -hmm. building. It's just that you have. You know, you have you have a quality hallmark that you can pull out and say, well, you know, I've gone through this process, um, and therefore, you know, I I I have uh, I have it well documented that this building uh, is, is 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 sustainable or is at least uh, fulfilling certain sustainability uh, criteria. Um, and what they finally, last but not least, they've also helped greatly in formalizing the uh, and systemizing data collection, especially for those areas um, that um, are not covered by things like EPCs, energy performance certificates or something like that. So the, 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 the more sort of social side. And I think that that's very important. Thank you, Ursula. Question directed to Hubert and also to Jacob. Jacob from the investor side and Hubert also from the uh, from this from the construction sector side, right? These building labels, right? Um, are they 
you know, they are meant to be also as a reference for investors, but uh, does it, are they considering the ecological backpack uh, of, of buildings? In other words, could you, you uh, could buildings labels and these standards be misused for greenwashing, you know? Um, what, what is your opinion on this? Well, actually, I I have uh, I have to support another time Ursula because she already said everything around this. Because if you look at all those aspects, it's hard to do greenwashing. I mean, now really, like like Warren Buffett once said, when the tide goes away, you know who has short pants. Okay, so with that with that greenwashing, you don't come very far in the future because everyone now gets uh, smarter the regulations the taxonomy like said i think i think this is on a on a good way very uh, i want to support what what jacob said before because there is such a cambrium explosion explosion of of construction and real estate uh, startups you know prop techs whatever is behind like technology in in designing in constructing in, in using whatever and 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 ninety percent will probably then implode again, but the rest will will do a really great uh, effort. And in that change, the green will prevail. Okay, that's that's a moment. That's a quite interesting moment because it's every time when you have a disruption, you can move because everyone is a little bit looking. Oh, what's happening here? And so and so the whole sustainability aspect goes with it. But one thing is different to the dot com like bubble which had some some because here we have new technology even platforms like Cree but it's always it has to be platforms to connect with the local because construction and real estate is local the sourcing should be quite local as possible the people working there normally is local I mean we have some pre, even prefab is in a region okay of transportation so the good thing now is we connect like digital models new business models with local uh, business that's a little bit the difference to the first thing but that gives really great investment possibilities we are investing too in very early stage prop and construction tech because we know what we're doing we can judge quite fast okay it makes sense does not make sense uh, because there are some ideas that are totally crazy. I mean, I love them, but but <laughs> sometimes I think it's so easy to sell at the moment because construction industry is so bad. I mean, they're so not organized. It's just the processes are, are so bad. So whatever, wherever you look, you can lift a stone and just said, okay, that's totally ineffective. I build something to make this more effective. Money, okay? But the point, the problem is that after... It has to be connected somehow in the whole process. That's where it ends normally. That's why it's so important to have a concept like like we, our approach at Cree, that we have an end-to-end -end thinking with all the partners from the developer, the designer to whatever technology comes in to, to keep that a little bit together. And the second thing is we are uh, re doing research now in new material, like really bionic stuff. I mean, we, we think about how to use bamboo, hemp, uh, uh, water, grass, we have to, to bring out of the, the rivers and the water to make stuff out of it. We really can use, I mean, that's working. No one was thinking about this. And the latest shit I say is what we're doing is we try to, 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 to use different mis micelles, you know, like, like mushrooms, like the micelle and grow out of, of Sagish Bene. I don't know what, what those small wood parts with the micelle you put in a form and it grows, uh, a brick, a very light brick in 48 hours. It just grows. There is no machine. There is no production, okay? And this is where we have to change. I don't, with the old th system thinking is not going to work. So we have to throw those things in. We have to try them. We have to show them. And that's where my, always my approach is, the power is in sharing these ideas, you know, give it to everyone, try this, try there. But then we have to see what they do and learn. So that's how we improve uh, even our own concept at Cree. I mean, you can do it with any idea. Just share it and look what people are doing with it. Thank you, Hubert. Jacob, with, with so many things going on, right? We, we talked about that volume that needs to be delivered by 2050. You know, the, um, there was a, Hubert mentioned the 3 million construction companies across Europe, you know, and so on with, with 25 people. You know that the construction sector is the way it is, but it's slowly changing, right? 
if you are, are there enough investors investing in green real estate or is there an imbalance in the market in your perspective? I mean, I, I'm not investing directly in real estate. And so my knowledge about the demand for investing into green real estate is based on what I, what I know from the innovators of green real estate, like, like Hubert, like Edge Technologies, like some of our investors who are at the forefront of, of doing these things. We have, an, we have an investor in our fund. They, they tried themselves to build houses from waste materials, right? And there was no supply chain. They had to figure it out all themselves. <laughs> this is not so easy. Um, <clears throat> so I think, um, but, but, I, but I think as, as, it, as, you know, the, as, as the carbon and the, and the sustainability gets priced increasingly, maybe first at the beginning sort of a shadow pricing, but then, I mean, I think there's, there's going to be a shift because the pension funds, for instance, who are a big, big part of the, of the investment community in real estate, at least the ones we meet, they're extremely demanding. And, and I think they're shifting uh, slowly now. So, so, so that's good. On the technology side, um, for, for the innovation we are speaking about, I think there's a lot of activity and there's a lot of investment and <clears throat> Maybe there's even uh, too much investment, but that that's fine. If you, as an investor, your challenge is to, you know, to see to see the, the the opportunities and then you know pick well. And that's why we in our fund we we have uh, we have you know uh, not just financial investors who who uh, who see the, the purpose and the opportunity, but we also have strategic investors who actually understand the industry. And it's very important for us uh, to to build and develop that knowledge and that edge together with real estate companies, construction companies, logistics companies. Um, new material or materials companies so that we <clears throat> can become as good as possible to identify, you know, where will it work or where is it a nice idea that will stop at some point uh, without having too much impact. Great. And in, in these legacy industries with, you know, you know, if they're very fragmented like construction or they're very conservative or maybe they have very high capital intensity like real estate and materials, you know, you need to find an effective wedge into the industry. And I often you know, speak about, people speak a lot about disruption. And yes, you need to have a lot of change. But if you try to, you know, flip everything totally on its head, then sometimes you don't get too far quick enough. So we also look for companies that try to work with the existing system, so to speak, and make it, make it work and make it scale. Mm -hmm. That being said, we need some of the really, uh, truly radical innovation. And we are also looking at, at materials companies that are using different, you know, uh, fungus or... <clears throat> Um, uh, uh, geopolymer technologies to create brick and basically build concrete from waste materials or from uh, from organic processes. And I think bioindustrial fermentation and bioindustrial production of stuff is going to be a relatively big theme uh, of the future. And we have an investor in our fund who is a leading uh, company in, and it comes from a surprising edge. That's a biotech company, uh, but they are the, basically the experts in this field. And uh, we we are looking at a concrete, uh, 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 you know a bacterial concrete company together at the moment, which is of course interesting to see how different domains of, of technology and investment and, and industry come together. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Um, Jacob, where, where, where do you see challenges when it comes to financing sustainable real estate? I mean, what, what are the solutions in your opinion to make it easier, right? Um, well, I mean, from a, from a venture capital perspective, I think there's always a lot you can do to stimulate innovation and entrepreneurship in, in economies. And this is very country specific. I think in the German speaking region, there are some, some historic challenges. And I think there's a lot of work being done to make it um, uh, more easy and more attractive to, um, uh, to, to be an investor in early stage, to take risk basically with your savings uh, as an investor, to also you know, motivate and incentivize employees to take risk with you as an entrepreneur, to join you on a crazy mission to change the world which is sometimes, uh, you know, the pitch. Um, and so there, there are many ingredients in that. So, but I think overall, the, the, the environment for investing into technology early stage in, in Europe, especially has evolved tremendously in the last 10 years. So the ecosystem has really grown. There's much more capital. The European investors are becoming, I think, um, more, uh, they're catching up with the, with the U.S. mindset. The U.S. mindset is a little bit different. You know, uh, there's more sort of propensity to take risk. There's, a, there's an understanding also in, in the U.S. that solving the big problems of society is, is on the, it's not just the state business, right? It's not just your government who has to figure it out. It's basically the private sector. It's the, the private individuals of the world who have to uh, help solving this. So that gives a different, I think, um, a drive in the entrepreneurship side. But 
But I really think that there's a great ecosystem in Europe and more and more great entrepreneurs and, and also investors are looking to, uh, to, to, to fund this. And in the construction sector, we've seen a lot of great activity in the last few years. And, and we're just really looking for the ones that we think can, can connect well with industry and really you know, sustainably have change over time. Um, <clears throat> but we're very optimistic. Excellent, right? Um, this is a little bit directed towards Hubert now. Um, the, the anticipated growth and uh, urbanization of the global population over the next several decades, right? will create a vast demand for the construction of new housing, commercial buildings, and accompanying infrastructure. And when you look at the production of cement, steel, and other building materials that are associated with this wave of construction, um, you know, this postulates a, that it will become a major source of greenhouse gas emissions, right? Now, my question is, is it possible to turn buildings into a global carbon sink, in your opinion? Well, first of all, we have to be realistic. There will be some parts and some type of buildings, tunnels, whatever, uh, infrastructure, they will strongly uh, be, be uh, dominated still by concrete, but they're good, good, good uh, solutions going that way, like Jacob already mentioned. And the other thing is uh, to, 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 to uh, make carbon storage technology that's what i call someone asked me once on the plane what is your business and i said i work in carbon storage technology that was like six years ago and they said wow that's that sounds really tech what kind of technology is that and then i said okay it's it's a chemical process you know you have sunlight and 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 and, and a plant is taking that so it's a long story short i mean at the end we have to, because if a tree dies and falls down and rots, it goes back to the atmosphere too. So it is definitely a way to do carbon storage with buildings if you use uh, timber in buildings, because you can use it for 100, 150 years, you can re reuse it. So it's definitely better than to burn, you know. Sometimes we hear that burning timber is like, uh, I don't know, green energy. It's not. I mean, you can do it end of the, the chain at the cascade, you know. So buildings can be somehow carbon storage uh, means, and because we have to build so many buildings, as you mentioned, and because the growth will be so big we have to go that way as fast as possible every part of the planet and it's not we have to change not just new or find new technology we have to share what we know that's what i already mentioned and the next thing is we have to trust each other it does not make sense that the mayor of hamburg does not trust the mayor or the the people of vienna because physics are the same it burns the same way in vienna than in hamburg you know, load bearing, physics are the same. So why don't you just accept if Viennese people build a nice, decent 84 meter high wood hybrid building? Why is not allowed to do that in Hamburg? You know, we always think about new technology, but if we have to tear down the barriers for existing technology at the same time, and that's not seen, it's always more sexy. We have to make nice green tech and do this and that, but... We have to go definitely that way. And if the EU taxonomy really wants to make a difference, they say, okay, the money goes to those countries who accept codes of other countries when they meet some sustainable rules, not every crap, but really those are. Then I can build with the Viennese code in Hamburg if they want to have a green in being in the green taxonomy scheme, that's for me, the strongest message to everyone out there who has some influence, Ursula. Yeah. This is super important. The regulatory, <laughs> the regulatory barriers locally and nationally to adopt new technology is a big thing. If you look at, for instance, if you look at, at, at concrete regulation, right, the industry has been very, very smart to introduce not performance-based regulation in many countries. So it's not about, you know, what can the concrete actually achieve, how strong is it, so on. It's been specified as to how much cement has to go into it in terms of volumetric, which is insane. <laughs> Makes absolutely sense. So you cannot replace cement with the, current, uh, with the current regulatory framework if you came up with a different approach to cement. So if you really scale the, the, the mycelium or the other bacteria or this other kind of approach, 
but you cannot build with it because it's not legal because the industry has prevented that. So that has to change. The local building codes need to be much more, uh, I think, standardized and, and you know, modular so you can move things around. I would also say that you know, wood is a, an amazing material. And, it, and, and I think this idea of doing hybrids so to kind of get the best properties of different things is really smart. Um, I would also say that if you want to build, if you really look at the global demand, the global south, Asia, everything, if you look at what really is needed to build another 2 billion homes or the infrastructure in the next decades, it's, it's like this, I think, was it Bill Gates who said we are building a, you know, the, the equivalent of New York City per month for four, day, four decades mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So there's just not enough wood. I mean, if you look at the actual deforestation you would need to do to build everything in wood, it would be very difficult. You'd actually need concrete or similar type. You need like a geopolymer type like stone material. So we need the innovation in that domain as well. And there's, there's a lot happening. And if you, at least if you could achieve to synthesize what rocks are doing, what the nature is doing when it creates like a shell or a limestone over time, and this is sort of technically possible, if you can scale that right, you can store enormous amounts of CO2 in concrete. If that really can work out, there are companies working on it. It's not easy. It's capital intensive. But if it worked, the amount of CO2 that's stored in the limestone that has sequestered over time from, you know, dying marine animals and so on, if you can synthesize that at scale, right, you can actually, so concrete could become the biggest lever for taking, uh, for taking CO2 out of the economy or one of them. Great. So, Hubert, let me ask you, is a mass timber building where far more timber is being put into the building uh, the right way to go about it? I think you need to think you need to think locally about it, right? It, it works. It works in certain uh, uh, ecosystems really well. I mean, the first time I came to Hong Kong when I lived in Asia, I was surprised to see those scaffolding is done with bamboo. Who would have thought? I think that's crazy. They can do that with bamboo instead of steel. That's amazing, right? But it's going to be hard to do in Copenhagen. Just just in FYI, there's not that much bamboo around. And shipping, it wouldn't make sense. Um, so I think you need to think locally about it, uh, local availability of materials uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and different types of wood that can be used. And also you build differently in different parts of the world. You need different kinds of buildings in, uh, in, in parts of the world where you may have other kinds of materials available. Yeah, I, like, I, like, I like to add just one thing. Uh, like you said, bamboo. Bamboo can grow here too, if you have the right bamboo. So it's always local. But we have to learn about looking to other countries, what we can do here to make more things locally. And uh, to answer uh, Volker's question, I mean, mass timber is better than conventional, but but uh, with, with a light hybrid uh, a wood system like we are proposing at Cree, it's, uh, you even have a much bigger impact using less resources. But both, both are nice and it's always a matter of where something fits, but from the material and from the resource consumption, uh, it's it's just second best, and I just want to have a like one one short uh, final from my side comment that what I learned in uh, reading a book now there is no such thing like things it's just events even a stone a stone if you look at a stone one million years it will dissolve go back and go somewhere and come back whatever but we see at it as a stone because our lifespan is so short so probably one part of the sustainability is thinking about everything as an event. <laughs> Very good point. Yeah. Um, I think if I may, if I may yeah. chip in here, really is I think one one key message of from my side would be is that um, I think traditionally, you know, investment was real estate investment was always uh, based around short uh, short investment cycles. Yeah, and I think this is where sustainability is a real game changer because sustainability will never stop. Yeah, it's not going away. And I think we, we need we, we keep having to do it. We keep having to reinvent uh, systems, models, uh, technologies to to, uh, you know, to to actually achieve it. And so therefore, I think there needs a, you know, a, a real change in mindsets is that we need to take a long term view and therefore, OK, maybe not you know, in our lifetime, you know, we will only see incremental changes. But we have already witnessed a, you know, huge changes in terms of mindsets, in terms of technology, in terms of legislation. When I started out, you know, this was still you know, it was all based around energy efficiency. It was, you know, and everything else was seen as pretty, pretty fringe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that has over a decade yeah, changed, especially within a sector that is traditionally quite conservative. Yeah? So we're seeing practices applied you know, locally, 
uh, by 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 builders, by contractors. We, you know, and now you know there's a real game changing aspect of of directing finance to these projects uh, and to actually making them happen. And I come back to one thing that was being discussed a bit earlier is the, you know, what what is the challenge for investors? I think the challenge is actually finding good projects. Yeah. Uh, because there is a lot of money in the market now, and there's a lot of willingness. So we need more good projects, yeah, projects that will deliver on all of those levels that we've been discussing today. Excellent. I thank you all so much. Uh, we have come to the end. Uh, we we did get some questions uh, from our audience that we will address personally in an email to the audience. Uh, Ursula, thank you so much for your input. Uh, it was a pleasure having you here. Uh, Jacob, great. Uh, I hope we stay connected uh, down uh, down down the road between us. And uh, Hubert, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to attend here. Thank you all uh, for joining us and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye.